Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our Fair and Education webinar, Teaching About Identity, Lessons from the Cultural Revolution. As Gavin's explaining right now in the chat box, it's disabled, but we will have a Q&A box um, and we'll preserve the last 15 minutes of our webinar tonight for discuss discussion. We'll also be sending out a resource following tonight's webinar with some recommended readings, two of which are books written by our panelists, and we will include those links as well for you. Uh, my name is Jennifer Tafudo. I'm a senior manager with FAIR in Education. I'm joined by Stephanie Guerra, FAIR's Managing Director of Education. In a time where teaching about identity is so controversial in schools, we are thrilled and excited to interview two people who experienced identity-based division during 1960s China as a way to understand how to avoid similar mistakes in today's K-12 classrooms. Shi Van Fleet describes herself as Chinese by birth, American by choice, survivor of Mao's cultural revolution, defender of liberty. She was born in China, lived through the cultural revolution, and was sent to work in the countryside at the age of 16. After Mao's death, she was able to go to college to study English and has lived in the United States since 1986. She now devotes her time and energy full time to warning about the parallels between Mao's cultural revolution in China and what's unfolding in America today. Her book, Mao's America, A Survivor's Warning, was recently published and is currently ranked number seven on Amazon in Asian politics. Dr. Ping Nan Shi, known as Dr. Ping to his students, grew up in China during the traumatizing era of the Cultural Revolution. He moved to America with his wife and infant son in 1995 after finishing graduate studies in Canada. In the summer of 2021, he was alarmed by changes in Indiana state government and major school corporations. After in-depth research, he traced their roots to Marxism. Realizing the danger of communism in America, he started to give talks and publish essays and books, including his 2022 book, A Specter is Haunting America, warnings from survivors of communism. He is dedicated to teaching middle and high school students about the evil nature and mass destruction of communism. She and Dr. Ping, thank you for joining us. We are so honored and excited to speak with you. Um, before we get started, I'd like to share with the audience that this interview is part of an ongoing research project at Fair and Education. So there's a lot of controversy around the ways that identity is being framed in American classrooms right now. And we wondered if a historical understanding of other countries' experiences with teaching about identity might help teachers get a big picture view and recognize and avoid mistakes. So we have been examining three 20th century contexts, 1930s Germany, 1960s China, and 1980s and 90s Rwanda, where teachers made serious mistakes in teaching about identity, um, mistakes that at the time seemed scientific or unifying or correct or even culturally necessary, but actually laid a foundation for intergroup hatred and violence. We read history texts, memoirs, um, translations of lesson plans, textbooks, and other primary source materials. And now we're conducting interviews with people who have direct experiences with these contexts. So thank you both so much for being part of this project and sharing your experiences. Now, you both grew up in China and experienced the Cultural Revolution firsthand, and you have both written and spoken extensively about the Cultural Revolution and what you're seeing here in the United States. So let's set some context for our viewers. Can you please tell us briefly about the Cultural Revolution? Um, okay, I start. Okay. Um, cultural Revolution uh, took place in China in uh, started in 1966. And uh, it was launched by Chairman Mao, the dictator uh, of China. And it, it lasted for 10 years until his death in 1976. So it's 10 years of uh, um, cultural revolution. And what it is really about is really to replace the system. And uh, and, and in today's world is uh, just uh, um, really destroy what's uh, old, what's out of date, and uh, replaced with something new. And, uh, and what they are trying to destroy in China was the uh, the Chinese civilization. And uh, they call it for old, old uh, ideas, old tradition, old uh, habit, and old custom. And they all should have to, uh, they all should go. And that including the uh, statues and uh, um, from, uh, from temples and churches, and they should be uh, uh, destroyed and replaced by Chairman Mao statue everywhere in cities. And also, and they also uh, went after names. 
names for institutions, for, uh, for streets, um, they all have to change into uh, something more politically correct. Basically, it was just destroy everything that is uh, old, that is traditional, and that's today's cancel culture. And so why they want to destroy everything? Because Mao want to, uh, want to replace everything with his version um, of uh, um, the uh, Marxism ideology, which is Maoist. And so, and, and there are so many parallels and we're gonna talk more about it, but that's just general an idea. It is a revolution to destroy everything. And uh, and they want to rebuild, we build a basically utopian, um, Marxist utopia. Yeah, uh, I was uh, uh, younger than she, so I didn't uh, 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 went to the countryside, uh, but. All of my uh, brothers and sisters, they were old enough to be sent to the countryside. And uh, my experience with cultural revolution is that uh, when I was about five, my uh, my dad was uh, locked up in a makeshift uh, prison. That's when the Mao was dismantling the party hierarchy uh, and uh, then witnessed the the killings of uh, between different fractions of the Red Guards and later on uh, how they were sent to the countryside. And uh, uh, I did a lot of uh, thinking in uh, after the Cultural Revolution uh, in the early 80s, is trying to figure it out why and why would that happen. So so that's something I kind of share in my book. Uh, and uh, I was actually alarmed uh, because like she said that uh, we experience a period that everything has to be wiped out because it's uh, imperial and uh, colonial kind of history. So like say for example, when you have a street, you don't call that uh, like, uh, if you have a kind of a foreign name like uh, uh, Johnson Street, then you have to replace it. Uh, or you have something like, uh, uh, kind of reflecting the old Chinese tradition, uh, even things like uh, like something like say nice or happiness or uh, fortune, and those things has to go, has to be replaced with new one. So so uh, I saw how the things get uh, being like uh, the statues of like in this country, like the Confederate uh, generals being taken out and even like people like uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson and, and also uh, how they trying to blame everything on uh, imperialism and col uh, colonialism and all that. So it's kind of similar, uh, um, how to say, similar uh, terminology that they're being used and, and also is trying to uh, divide people into two different classes, like the oppressed and the oppressor, which is typically uh, Marxism. So that's how I can get get him uh, uh, into this uh, fight, because I really don't want to see uh, cultural revolutions or at least anything similar to that um, happening here. Thank you both. So you know, you mentioned the destroying of the four olds and Dr. Ping, your father, being locked up um, in a makeshift jail. If we back up a little bit, what were the first changes that you noticed happening, um, particularly in school, leading up to the Cultural Revolution? You know, when did you realize that something was wrong in China? Um, it, to me, it is almost day and night. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, as a little girl, I was only seven when it started. And I just... Uh, um, all of a sudden, I just uh, uh, saw that uh, uh, the students were encouraged to challenge uh, anyone that has uh, authority, and anyone in authority's role. And to students, the first one they challenged was teachers and the principals. So they went after um, their own teachers and did pretty much overnight, and because uh, that's what Mao told them to do. They Mao. Uh, Mao told them that uh, the uh, reactionary uh, bourgeois intellectual authority was the problem for China. 
because those people, they still have the old ideas. They still teach the old ideas to students. And th th those ideas are dangerous because those ideas want to uh, undermine socialism. And so as students, we were so um, indoctrinated, we, we have no idea what was uh, how, uh, what was bad about capitalism because I did not know what capitalism was re really about. I just uh, was taught it is evil. So those teachers and the principals, they want to teach us capitalist ideas, bourgeois ideas to really to, um, to bring us back to capitalism. So they become our enemies. So once that's um, a label what, what was uh, um, given to the, uh, uh, the the group, here's the key word, group. It's not never about the individual, it's about the group. So if you're a teacher, if you are um, an administrator, you're a principal, um, then you become the enemy group. So what we need to do is overthrow them. So school was really the kids um, were encouraged to uh, to take down the principles. So school become uh, um, dysfunctional. There's no one was in charge. So the, in my case, my school was closed for two years in other parts of China and it's lasted as long as four years, no school. And because no one was in charge and that was pretty much everywhere in China, middle school, high school, college, universities, it's all like that. So the the change was not gradual. The change was, to me, it, it is overnight. And to a lot of people, they probably can relate to 2020, when all of a sudden they turn, they notice something really, really big was going on, was happening. And that's my memory. Yeah. Uh, for me, that the first thing I noticed is that uh, uh, the school were, were closed. And, uh, yeah, closed. Yeah. yeah. Or school and uh, of course my uh, my uh, I'm the youngest in the family so uh, my my brothers and sisters they were in elementary school and middle school so they were happy you know no school right <laughs> exam and all that and they were all kind of mobilized and organized and 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 trying to uh, basically they uh, uh, they want to go to Beijing and to see uh, Chairman Mao and uh, for a period of time that uh, all the transportations uh, were free. So anyone wants to go to Beijing, they can just hop, hop on the tree and it's going there. Uh, and then uh, then things turned uh, downhill for us, for my family. Uh, and then our family was ransacked and a lot of things were stolen and just not stolen, they just took it. Uh, and then uh, later on, pretty soon that uh, my dad was put into a uh, uh, makeshift uh, prison and uh, my mom and the, us kids were kicked out of our, our apartment and uh, we have to move to a, to a countryside and to live in a mud house. So that was a quite traumatic, traumatic for me uh, for the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. It sounds it, it de uh, wow, it's shocking to hear that. So in thinking about kind of drawing the parallels between what you noticed that was wrong in China, when did you realize that something was wrong here in the US? Uh, to me, and um, actually it's going back, I just noticed you know, things along the way. And uh, I, I think it's in the early nineties, I started to notice that uh, the uh, political correctness is taking over. American lives. And uh, so we were constantly told that we need to say certain things, certain way, and that certain things and certain way keep changing. And that just kind of reminded me of uh, what's going on, what, what I experienced in China, because there was only one correct way of thinking, and there was only one correct way of talking and speaking. And if you uh, if you did it differently and then you become the enemy of the state and then you you get into trouble. And uh, so, but that did not uh, um, uh, really, I, I did not lose uh, sleep over those things, but I noticed that and it's getting worse and worse. And uh, so the turning point for me is 2020 when I really witnessed and uh, what I witnessed or everyone 
else in in America. Um, it's really a, 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 a kind of a, um, I, I would say it, it's to me, it's upheaval. Upheaval to me is what I saw when I was uh, in China and remind me of the Cultural Revolution and, and what uh, the uh, the Red Guards did on the street. And uh, and it become really, really violent. In the beginning, you know, it's taking down statues, changing names, force people to uh, to conform of all sorts of things. They came up with all sorts of rules that girls can only have certain hairstyle. If your hairstyle was not up to the uh, standard that, that they uh, uh, arbitrarily said you were stopped and your hair was cut. They have uh, hair cutting stations by the Red Guards and I witnessed they uh, cut uh, girls' hair because it was not the right style. And the clothes, you can only wear this and not that. If you wear, back then there was um, uh, like, um, um, uh, what's the style of that big tra uh, trousers? And, uh, and that's considered bourgeois. And they will go after people wearing the wrong type of clothes and cut it. So that was uh, the really the demand conformity. And then, and then in what I saw in 2020 is there is absolutely the same thing. They demand that there's uh, only one way of thinking. Everything else is racist, bigot, Whatever now they uh, the the label keep expanding, and so to me that was uh, how I noticed things and how I really determined the turning point. And that's because of 2020, I decided to go to a school board in Loudoun County in Virginia, and, and told them that uh, what they're pushing in uh, in school the CRT is really the uh, Chinese Cultural Revolution repeating. Yeah, uh, for me, the first thing I noticed is actually in the, uh, I think, nine, uh, 2012, 2013, that kind of, I don't remember exactly. Uh, my wife actually went to uh, uh, IU University and um, doing her graduate study at, at in the in the uh, School of Education. So. Uh, her professor actually told uh, her and her classmate that their job is to make social activists. That was a shock to me because mm -hmm. that's something familiar. Like when we doing the Cultural Revolution, that's we have been constantly told that uh, that's our mission is to change the world. Uh, so it's nothing is is not about academics. So that was the first time, and then uh, I noticed something's not get it, it, it's getting like the political correctness, but really, really kind of shocked me is uh, in the summer of 2021 and the uh, Indiana state government hired uh, uh, DEI, uh, hired a uh, DEI um, director and, and also have a office there, there. And then a couple of major, uh, uh, very good uh, public school uh, district, they, the corporations also hire um, similar directors. So that's kind of sounds familiar to me because during the Cultural Revolution and we have those so-called political officers came to our school and their job is to make sure that uh, teachers and uh, following the parties, uh, um, following the party uh, party line and uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, to indoctrinate uh, indoctrinate us and and then I can start to uh, go to the resource pages uh, in different schools and find actually uh, a book that is very popular is a uh, um, uh, Abraham X Kennedy's book how to be an anti-rist and that was very po popular and he has been invited to talk in different school uh, you know um, to uh, to teach um, teachers. So I read his book and that was shocking to me because that just, uh, that just purely communism. And he actually have a, 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 a passage in his book. Uh, so, so in his book, he's, he said that capitalism is essentially racist. Racism is essentially capitalist. 
they were burst together from the same unnatural causes and they shall one day die together from unnatural causes. So he tied up, tied up racism with capitalism and he wants to destroy capitalism because he wants to destroy racism. So that was a shock, shocker to me because how could any school corporate uh, really have uh, teachers go and read this? And then of course, from that point on the uh, things getting worse in many school board, I went to school board and uh, some meetings uh, and even to the uh, the state uh, capital and just uh, Indiana state uh, capital. And uh, they just, the, the, there was a lot of concerns from the parents and especially also during the COVID, parents find out that their, their children are, uh, didn't, are not learning anything. Um, actually, I wrote a book. My first book is about our our children are not prepared because what kids are not learning, they are not prepared uh, academically. This uh, a lot of people uh, just couldn't read and write. Uh, a lot of high schoolers, their math level is just about like fourth and fifth. But but the school board and uh, they don't care. They don't care about academics. So that's how I kind of like tying things together. Now, if, if your goal is to make uh, social activists, the academics is nothing, which is something happened in the uh, during the Chinese Cultural Revolution. If you are good in academics, then you will be uh, criticized and you have to be a, a political activist. You have to be a, a, you know, a devout and uh, communists. And uh, if you if you don't do that, if you're just good in, in academics, you are you are bad people. You are actually being you'll be uh you're getting in a lot of trouble. Uh so so kind of everything kind of uh to me is kind of clicked is that uh I can I made that connection. And I did spend time actually trying to trace uh CRT back to uh uh, uh cultural commun uh Marxism. And uh, so that's how kind of I get in actually uh, in a way reluctantly, but eventually got involved because I find that uh, people like uh, she and I, if we don't say anything, then uh, we didn't we we didn't do our job because we experienced something terrible and we don't want to have same thing happens here. We don't have want those things happening to our kids. Yeah, we're so grateful that you are that you are sharing your stories. And you know, when you were just speaking, uh, Dr. Ping, about that emphasis on activism instead of academics, I can testify, you know, after 30 years total in education and 20 years in teacher training, that is absolutely true. Um, I want to read a quote by Mao that connects exactly to what you just said. In all it, he said this in one of his speeches, in all its works, all schools should aim at transforming the ideology of the students. Schools must carry out struggle, criticism, and transformation. They must practice economy while making revolution. And then he goes on to prescribe political training and military training for all the teachers and students. But you're right, that shift towards social um, activism um, is a profound shift. And one thing I've been very curious about in my research is when that crossover into violence happens, because there's a buildup, a significant and long buildup that takes place in people's psyches before they erupt into devastating violence. And my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that the first outbreak of violence committed by young people in the Cultural Revolution was actually a group of students who murdered their principal um, uh, and then were a little nervous at first, but realized that Mao approved and that other adults approved, and then a wave of violence spread over the country. My understanding is that millions of people were murdered or committed suicide, but um, it, is that, does that comport with what you know as well? Yeah, it, it's actually uh, uh, the, the Netflix TV series, Three Body Problems, that was a beginning scene is about a uh, 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 physics professor was being beaten to death because he uh, he insists that uh, he was teaching like uh, relativity uh, in his class, but the 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 thing is, 
uh, the people who actually beating him uh, were like high school students, high school girls. And mm -hmm. that actually came from a true incident. Uh, there are many like that. Uh, it was uh, a group of like 14 uh, year old uh, um, uh, girls, the female student actually beating their principals to death. Uh, so that the violence and all that and uh, uh, it, yeah, it's it, it definitely, I mean, of course, for me, I didn't experience that. I live, I experienced something later on is when the Red Guards were turning against each other to have different factions and they were uh, really killing each other. They were actually just kind of like, there was actually a civil war, like the people were uh, shooting at each other. And uh, my, uh, my, uh, ha my, my apartment actually is in between the two factions. So, so you see, you hear the bullets actually passing through us. Yeah, wow. but that was a yeah very very traumatic, I mean, traumatic uh, experience. Uh, can I? I uh, I just want to uh, address this. Why, um, a for, uh, you know the uh, some are preteen, some are teen, uh, students were turned into killers. And that has to go, we have to go back to the indoctrination. The indoctrination by the communists and, uh, and the way Dr. Pin and I were part of that, I, you know, we were, uh, everyone had to go through the uh, government school. And what we're taught is uh, we have to have clear um, love and uh, hate. We will love the party. We love Chairman Mao above Everything else, if you have to choose between your parents and your uh, and uh, and uh, the party, you always choose the party, and not even you don't even give it a thought because the party was our real parents, and the uh, uh, Chairman Mao was our real father, and then we our love is reserved for them, and the hate, we need to hate with all our might the enemy of the state. Okay, so who are the enemies? The party tell a uh, party would tell us who the enemies uh, were, and uh, so um, and I remember as a little girl, and uh, so overnight, if the principal was uh, labeled as enemy, to me, she literally looked like a bad person, and so and we would just go after them, and uh, including killing. And just like Dr. Ping uh, described already, the first killing was uh, um, took place in a very pre prestigious middle school for girls in Beijing. And the girls were just from 12 to 16. And they're all from a uh, where to do family. Basically, they're from high level CCP cadres. Um, so they just took their principal out and, uh, and gave her a struggle session, just like what's described in the uh, opening scene of uh, Three Body Problem, and they beat her, tortured her, and then killed her. Actually, the girls were a little, uh, little scared. They did not know what to do uh, after they found out the, uh, the principal was dead. So actually, it was reported to the uh, so-called Cultural Revolution Committee, and they heard nothing. After that, it became a commonplace. After that, in uh, August, it's called Red August in Beijing because it's red with blood. Mm -hmm. It's a bloodbath. They killed thousands, thousands of people by the Red Guards. And the only thing you need to do is you wear that armband called Red Guards. You could do any, everything and anything. Um, no one can stop them because the police, like here, defund the police, but there is destroy the, uh, um, it's called, um, criminal justice system. The whole system was destroyed and the policemen were told, if the red guards hit you, you're not allowed to hit back. So with uh, no one there to keep the order, with Mao clearly declared he was the red commander in chief of the red guards, they, they, uh, and there's no one to stop them. They, they start to kill. Just like Dr. Pin said, they start to kill a lot of people, millions of died, but eventually this, they, they thought now they are in control. See, they thought that Mao would let them share power. They were dead wrong. 
So when they started to fight each other for power, that was the time when Mao used the military to suppress them and meaning to kill uh, some of them and send the rest to the gulags to be re-educated by the peasants. And by the time I graduated from high school, there was no place for me to go because the economy was totally destroyed. There's no employment opportunity. So all urban youths were sent to the countryside. So I was the last group. I was the first, I was in first grade when Cultural Revolution started, but I was the last group to send to the countryside. I spent three years in the countryside getting my so-called re-education from the peasants doing the hard labor and it, it's it's uh, it's gulags mm -hmm. there's no uh, nice word yeah for it yeah it's a, actually it's way worse even uh way worse than slaves yeah I, 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 you wrote about that in your book, and it really struck me that you wrote about how you were told so frequently um, that you were masters, but the fact is you were being exploited in slavery. Yeah, um, yeah, and that, that really struck me. And I think it's uh, it's really, um, I think the problem here in America is that the history of uh, the horror of communism was never taught. It, it, it was not taught in school. And actually they taught uh, earlier, like in the, uh, even up to eighties, I, I heard people say they, they do hear, uh, learn a little bit of uh, the horror of communism, but then it's totally out of the curriculum. People do not know. And when, when I went to a, a Loudoun school board to give that uh, one minute speech, uh, a lot of people probably was the first time heard such a thing as Chinese Cultural Revolution. It is totally something that they never uh, learned about. And also, it's just as recent as just a few weeks ago when the three-body uh, problem opening scene was aired. So many people were shocked to say, how come someone said, I was... Uh, I'm 60-some years old. How come I never heard about this cultural revolution yeah good question and that's the problem with our um educational system not teaching real history well i mean oh sorry stephanie go ahead no i'm just nodding <laughs> yeah. go ahead Jen. well i was i was going to ask why do you think that is in in the u.s but it also kind of ties into thinking about certain educational practices that we do need to support or protect to avoid some of those violent outcomes that you shared with us. Can you speak to that a little bit more? Um, I think uh, um, the reason is, it's not like they overlooked it. The reason is, and the uh, educational system has been really hijacked by Marxists and they are really <coughs> teaching um, what's called the Ferrari uh, educational ideology. Uh, Polo Ferrari, uh, it was a, a Brazilian educator. He was considered the really the uh, the grand uh, the father or grandfather of uh, um, Marxist education for the West. And what he was trying to do is to teach the students to be social activists, not to uh, not as uh, citizens. The traditional education was to. Uh, train the uh, kids to be responsible citizens, to be uh, really um, responsible or um, uh, to be uh, individuals so that they can choose their own way of uh, succeeding in the future. And But that's not the goal of the, our today's uh, educational system. It's really to help the kids to become activists. In the Mao's world is to become revolutionaries, and Dr. King has talked about that already. So it is by design; it's not an accident. Yeah, I I, I agree with she. I I did um, uh, some uh, research on how things changed uh, over years, education, and it definitely there was it is a total. Uh, take over at least by the ideology of communism in uh, Americans' higher education, and uh, what we see now in uh, at the 
middle school and high school level in recent years, it's just a natural uh, progression of that ideology. Uh, yeah, because all the teachers are from uh, universities. So yeah, yeah eventually um, it's the same same people. They, uh, they got their education from uh, professors who teach them uh, Marxist ideology. And then they become teachers. They, they teach our kids K to 12. They teach what they learned from their professors. And that has been that way for a long, long time, even in the 30s. And so and people probably need to know a little bit of uh, Jiang Dui. He was considered the father of uh, American public education, but he was the one, the instrument of this ideology into the system. You know, <clears throat> I hear you. There's been a really interesting trajectory in terms of the theory that informs our American education. But I think we also have a longstanding commitment to some really strong values. And I believe that there are still many incredible teachers trying their best to work against very flawed curricula and methods and overarching structures. And so when, when you think about the best of American education, even if you have have to reach back to the past, what do you think is worth saving, preserving, fighting for in American classrooms? Um, okay, I just talked to um, a, um, a group of um, uh, people who are running at the classic uh, school in Maryland. It's called uh, Divine Mercy, Mercy Classic School. And when I look at their curriculum, when I look at uh, their reading list, what a day and a night uh, between what they're teaching and what uh, uh, is taught to the uh, public school students. What we need to go back, what I see is we don't need to create anything new. We just have to restore the traditional way of teaching, teaching the values that made this country possible. And, and that is classic, um, um, uh, classic uh, books, that our founding fathers read and that made them, uh, they uh, gave them the ideas that made it possible for them to build a country like America. And we, we just need to go to basics. And uh, the other thing is that I think it's important for people to know what is Marxist, what is communism? Um, they tell you, it's not, we, we don't have to guess. In uh, Marxist, uh, in the communist manifesto, uh, Karl Marx, and uh, and uh, Frederick Engels, they spelled it out what their goal is. Their goal is to destroy private ownership, private property, and end uh, capitalism. But they also um, made it the, um, their goal to destroy religion, specifically to destroy Christianity and to destroy um, family. They have been very successful in doing all that. When we lose our um, religious, um, uh, when we lose our faith, we lose the uh, our moral compass, and we no longer know uh, what is right or what is wrong. And that's why they can push all sorts of things. They can push things like, a, "What is a woman?" A question that is so absurd. But yet now we are struggle with this. What is a woman? It's because we have left our moral compass so far away and uh, we don't know. We don't know the answer. Even the uh, um, the, the, the people who uh, become our justice can answer this simple question. What is a woman? Yeah, uh, I actually uh, wrote a book. My latest is uh, it's called uh, uh, Education 4.0. So I did actually uh, in-depth study about, yeah, thank you. The history of education, not just in this country, but as a human, uh, uh, as a human uh, uh, race, and uh, from different cultures and all that, and you can see that uh, uh, the the current, especially the public school, uh, is a uh, in a way is a product of the industrialization, uh, because society needs a lot of workers and soldiers. And uh, and that's why well, actually our public school uh, education the system actually was copied from uh, uh, Germany, but that was before the uh, 
uh, it became German. It was a Pru uh, um, Prussia uh, uh, system. So that was actually being transported um, by uh, Horace Mann, who is the father of uh, American public education. And uh, so that the, the goal for that one is really just produce workers and soldiers and and uh, and now uh, that model has been outdated. I mean, a lot of people have been saying that uh, because now, um, first of all, we don't need that many workers. And then now with the uh, advance of AI, you can see that that has re going to has already replaced a lot of white collar uh, uh, jobs. So a lot of college graduates are facing this challenge that they won't be able to find a job because AI will do that, uh, will, uh, uh, will, will take over their job. So what kind of education do we need? So uh, during my research, I can find out actually we have to go back. Just like she said, the, the classic education, uh, which actually uh, uh, we used to have in America. In America, early uh, years, we actually have home schools and uh, uh, Latin schools and all of that. So they are being trained. Uh, more trained have to uh, to train uh, to be able to think uh, logically, to be able to think critically, and to be able to learn new things. Uh, and that's what we need right now because uh, nowadays, even if you learn a, a good skill, who knows? How long you, that is still needed it might change something else. You have learned something new, and that we have to learn, uh, have the ability to learn new things, and which is uh, what, uh, which is something we don't have in our public education. The kids not, knows how how to do the work, but they they couldn't do anything else. And what even worse, this is what I say even in private schools, most of the kids when they get educated, I mean, quote unquote, in school. They won't touch that anymore. Like, just look for example, how many, how many kids hate math, and math is so essential, so useful. But the kids, once they get go through school, they're not going to touch my math again. They are being fed up or even traumatized by that. So that's how the system uh, is really outdated. We need to change it, and I think the change actually is going back to. Uh, small schools and uh, uh, parents um, uh, directed, uh, uh, and also um, definitely not uh, to be controlled by the government. And we see things like that. I mean, even like the state of Indiana, and if you want to be accredited, then you have to teach social emotional learning. That's That's required. And so we really need to give back the, the education, the, the the responsibility and the uh, the authority back to the parents, so that uh, their kids can have a good uh, uh, classic education and put a lot of emphasis on how to learn, because that's the key. Uh, I don't know if you get, uh, if you read uh, the the uh, speech by uh, Doris. Uh, singer, Seer, Doris Seer. Oh, yes, I think I know what you're talking yeah, the about. The last tools of uh, learning. Oh, yes, that yeah. is, a, that's a classic. Right, right. I really appreciate her, her last sentence is that uh, uh, if we cannot teach students, cannot teach people to learn on their own, then we fail that. And that was the, the problem we are having. The kids don't know how to learn on their own. They always waiting for you. Tell them. You tell me what is, what is right. I write it, and that's the big thing. As math teacher, I have to over, help them overcome that. And they always say, well, "What do you think? What is a good answer?" I say, I, "What do you think?" You know, you should have the confidence to say this is a crack because I follow the rules. I mean, I, I did all the things. You know, I follow the logic. This, this is. It doesn't matter who said, who said that. I have the confidence. And that's something definitely lack, lacking uh, in, in definitely in the public education uh, uh, system. And well, you uh, definitely have the experience there. I mean, and your wife is a teacher as well. Right. Um, I, yeah, and for, for all of you in the audience, I highly recommend Dr. Ping's 
uh, several books and she van fleet's excellent book miles america we'll we'll put the information in the chat and we'll also send it in our research list. Before we get to Q&A, I do have one important question to touch on, and it's circling back to the title of the webinar. It has to do with teaching about identity. Now, I read a lot as I've um, been doing this project, and one book that made a really significant impact on me is uh, this book called The Red Guard's Path to Violence by Jing Lin. Um, he was also was a survivor of the Cultural Revolution, and um, he, I'm going to read just two sentences from him. Um, he says, in the process, he's talking about his research, in the process, it has become clear to me that in large part, it was non-critical, categorical thinking that had taken over the Red Guards, which led to their destructive behaviors. This destructive categorical thinking came as a consequence of features in the political, cultural, and educational system that prevailed long before the Cultural Revolution, features that prepared the Red Guards psychologically to engage in such massive damage to human dignity and precious lives. And the reason um, that I landed on that quote to ask you about is because categorical thinking is sort of a key feature of the way that we're approaching identity today in classrooms. And I was wondering if you could tell us just a little bit about the categorical thinking during the cu cultural revolution, which looks, you know, it looks quite, it's distinct. It, it's its own flavor. Yeah, I know that that's the title of this uh, um, webinar, Identity, what is identity? And a lot of people here in America, the first thing to think about uh, identity is race. But in a, uh, in a country like China, 95% of us are Han Chinese, look like me and uh, Dr. Ping. You can tell the difference. We're just the same people sharing the same language and culture and everything. How do you uh, divide them and, uh, and based on identity? And that's what Mao did, using class. So it's way before the Cultural Revolution. And it was as soon as the uh, communists took over China in 1949, they started their first campaign for, uh, it's called uh, land reform. What they did is they categorized the entire Chinese peasantry, uh, which is uh, up to 90% of the population into five categories. And uh, landlord, rich, fa uh, rich peasant, middle-class peasant, lower middle-class peasant, and a proletariat. And then divided into divided into two categories, the rich peasants and uh, uh, landlord were called a black uh, uh, class, bad enemy of the state, and the rest are called red. And that's how they uh, divide and label uh, Chinese people. And that's something that's very serious. It's become part of the, your identity, and you pass it down to your children and your children's children. What it means to be a black class uh, person is that you are denied of the basic rights that the others have, like going to college, your kids can't go to college. And when we fill out uh, any uh, government documents, you have to fill out one, um, uh, one area is called your class origin, what kind of class, and uh, black or red. And if you uh, um, belong to the black class, you, you, you have no chance of uh, getting a good job. Even if you have a job, you have denied the opportunity of uh, promotion. And that's how Mao divided Chinese people and labeled them using identity. And in America, we know that they use, also use class. Like uh, Bernie Sanders still believe that it is uh, 1% versus 99%. So the, uh, the 1% were the uh, bad people. The rich, the billionaires, not even millionaires, but the billionaires, they're the problem. And then by race, and now by gender, by sexuality, they use this to really divide people and everyone gets a, a identity and who don't get identity. And um, usually it's the white, uh, male, straight, middle class, and you know, you know the rest. And, and that is so, so, so important to understand. It is the same trick. It is from the same Marxist playbook to divide a population by identity. Some is real, some is made up. And then the, the goal is to divide people in order to control them. Yeah, like uh, during the Cultural Revolution, every family has uh, uh, a booklet 
it's kind of residence booklet. And on that booklet, list out like the parent's name, the kid's name, and uh, what class you belong to. You belong to this class or that class. So that's something go with you. And also when you're starting to work, you have a dossier, a dossier to go with you no matter where we go. That's this out everything like your me. Uh, if you uh, grandparents or uh, as a landowner, then you belong to that class, even though you had nothing. Uh, but that's how they uh, separate people. But there is also, uh, in a way, like the party allow you to redeem yourself if you kind of call, uh, you betray your your class. You want to be a you know want to be a get into the 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 red class. Then you have to. Uh, do something. Normally, you see that those uh, people hitting uh, their teachers and a lot of that sometimes is the, the kids from the bad class. They want to redeem themselves. So they actually become violent on, on teachers and other peoples. Yeah, it's really, I mean, everything we look through. And that's what we call the uh, class consciousness uh, back then. That means you have to uh, not only aware your own class, you have to wear other people's class. Like so, everything just turn into you know you are this class and I'm that class. So therefore, and we are supposed to love our class, you know the red class, but you you hate the black class and uh, whatever you know the bad things I mean violent thing you can do towards them. That just shows that uh, that you are loyal to your you know, red class. So this is, the whole thing is, um, it's so, so during the cultural revolution, everybody knows who, who I mean, which class uh, anyone's belonging to. And here we are taught to have uh, racial consciousness and no longer, we, we don't no longer believe that we should be colorblind, but we are told to be color brave that we should always see color of the skin color is become the, uh, the, the dominant factor. And, uh, and as white people, you should uh, admit your white guilt. Just like in, in China, if you belong to the black class, you're guilty, guilty of uh, owning land that your grandfather did. Then you never saw the, uh, the land yourself, but it doesn't matter. That is the new uh, kind of original thing. In China, the original thing was wealth that your family used to own a property or land. And here the original sin become whiteness. And mm -hmm. if you are white, you are guilty. You are guilty of uh, slavery. You are guilty of colonialism, imperialism, in uh, Jim Crow, just all these bad things. It's, it's all because white people. And because of that, if you have, um, if you're born white, then you are guilty. I again, I can't emphasize enough. This is nothing new. That's why it's so important to, to learn history. Once you know history, you say, oh, this is nothing new. They happened before and happened over and over in different countries in under communism because they all come from the same playbook. That's Marxism. Yeah, the, yes. the oh, sorry, Dr. Ping, go ahead. Sorry, the 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 uh the basic uh, the worldview of Marxism is to look uh, through the lens of oppressors against the oppressed. There's always those two classes. I mean, sometimes it's really between the people who own the property versus people who don't have it, the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat, and sometimes just between different races. You know, in this class, in here, uh, in America, is really the white versus. Uh, people of color. And there is this funny thing is, uh, how about the Chinese Americans? Actually, Chinese Americans will not consider people of the color. We are considered, uh, you know, uh, part of the white people, at least as- White, white adjacent. Adjacent uh, people. So it's kind of funny uh, in that way. And uh, it's because we don't fit in their narrative, because their narrative that is, America is inherently racist, and so therefore, if you're doing well in this society, then you definitely uh, not belong to the people of color. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I want to thank both of you for sharing all of these parallels as chilling as they are. I think it's so important that your message gets out there. Um, we only have a few minutes left. I kind of anticipated that we'd have a little more time for Q&A, but that's okay. Um, I think everything you, you both said is incredibly important. So the first question we received, and you kind of just touched on this, Dr. Ping, is to really draw that specific connection between what's happening now, I presume, in the U.S. and Marxism. Can, can either or both of you um, touch on that? Yeah, I, I, actually, in my book, uh, I, I actually um, describe how I trace the back from what's happening now back to uh, the Marxism. So it's, it, it's I guess, uh, it is hard to say in just a couple, you know, <laughs> seconds, but definitely uh, that book uh, provides the, the whole thing, the how, how the things got traced back. Uh, it definitely, go, uh, for me, it took me a while to understand the connection. Uh, sometimes I can see the parallel, but as a as a teacher and the, and I was trained as a scientist, I have to make that more kind of scientific approach to really uh, give the, um, you know, give the uh, the the sources and also uh, why why is that how the things get connected. There's a lot of things actually going on um, before what we have today. So if you want to look back and really you have to go back to more than 100 years ago and uh, how the things progress over the years. Great. Um, thank you. We'll definitely include your book titles for the registrants. Someone had asked, um, Shi, if you could repeat the name of the school that you mentioned in Maryland. The class oh, it's called the Divine Mercy Classic School. Divine Mercy Classic School. And right. there's a lot of schools like that, but uh, uh, well, not enough, <laughs> not enough. And uh, so they are really pushing for universal school choice and that will give them uh, an opportunity to grow more. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I saw a question there. Uh, 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 Someone said, I don't think parents are qualified. Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, some what depends first of all, uh, it depends on how we definitely have qualification. But in terms of teaching, uh, of course, uh, a lot of people, uh, teachers are not, uh, parents are not uh, to, to be qualified as a teacher. But the, still, the parents is authority. The parents has the final say which school they should send their kids to, and what kind of uh, you know materials, what kind of education their uh, their kids should uh, should take. Yeah, again, um, just kind of uh, to second uh, she about uh, there are definitely a lot of uh, summer schools, Latin schools, either the call Latin schools. Actually, right now I'm teaching at a, 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 a Latin school in Indianapolis, and also some call them classic um, studies or things like that. But definitely, as a parents, if you have a son, uh, have a kid, I mean, son and, and daughter in, in schools, uh, public, private, definitely go in and, and look at their curriculums and also how they, and make sure um, uh, they are really learning the uh, academics. And if, if not the case, you might think um, put them into different schools. And sometimes maybe you have to homeschool them. And uh, in terms of homeschool, I think uh, nowadays most uh, most of the parents are, are qualified to homeschool their own kids. Uh, not means they can qualify to teach every subject, but the, the, the parent actually can send their kids to different home homeschool co-ops, which can pro provide the, uh, you know, uh, some courses that the parents cannot offer or cannot not go, uh, was not comfortable <laughs> of, of teaching their kids. I think, you know, we're at the top of the hour now and um, Dr. Ping, that's such a great reminder to parents to really own um, responsibility for knowing the curriculum. I cannot emphasize my agreement with that enough. I, it really is true. Just, it does take 
energy. It can be exhausting. And sometimes it can be awkward to ask for the access, but it's so important. And, um, and I too know many, I, you know, the homeschooling movement is, is absolutely skyrocketing. I looked at the latest stats and we're looking at projected losses from public schools of up to five, state by state, anywhere between approximately 5% to 25% by 2030. We have a, just a couple of states that aren't projected to lose enrollment. Um, and homeschooling is on the rise. And the quickest growing population of homeschooling families are Black Americans. And I think they're just, you know, th these are things that most folks don't know. But anyway, thank you for sharing that advice in closing. I We are so grateful that you spent the time speaking with us and sharing your experiences and, um, and and speaking with our audience. So thank you both very much. And to all those in the audience, thank you for, for spending an hour with us this evening. And um, we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your night. Absolutely. And we will follow up with some resources. Thank you so much, she and Dr. Ping. It was great to see you both. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for the opportunity. Thank you, Stephanie. and. Uh... Jennifer, for this opportunity to share uh, with uh, uh, with your audience. Our pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, can I say one thing? Yes, please. One thing. And uh, yeah, you and we talk about those problems, but uh, uh, I am very, very optimistic because I see how many, uh, just like uh, Stephanie mentioned, the homeschool movement, uh, I see a more and more uh, parents are taking back uh, the responsibility of educating their kid. So I'm really, really helpful. I think the things, the country is uh, turning around. The pandering is actually swimming back. I see, I see that too, Dr. Peng. I see so many families just uh, really taking action, so the perfect way to close that optimism, especially considering all that you both have lived through. So thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.